In this presentation, we will be talking the, about the idea of moral taste buds or moral intuitions as also a kind of kind of behavior of our mind. To begin, let's look at this quote from psychologist Jonathan Haidt in his book, The Righteous Mind. He says, we humans all have the same five taste receptors, but we don't all like the same foods. It's the same for moral judgments. Think about, him, about this quote for a minute. What do you think he's trying to say with this? What could he mean by that? Here's a more extended version of this quote. So he says, we humans all have the same five taste receptors, but we don't all like the same foods. Just knowing that everyone has sweetness receptors can tell you why one person prefers Thai food to Mexican. It's the same for moral judgments. To understand why people are so divided by moral issues, we can start with an exploration of our common evolutionary heritage, but we'll also have to examine the history of each culture and the childhood socialization of each individual within that culture. So we can see already in this quote that different kinds of causes we will have to explore to understand why a particular person might feel a certain way or have certain opinions about a moral issue. And so with, within the field of moral psychology, here are two important moral psychologists, Jonathan Haidt and also Joshua Green. And the basic insight of moral psychology is that our sense of right and wrong is strongly intuitive and emotional. So meaning that moral judgment is greatly influenced by our fast thinking, automatic processes. And only afterwards, we tend to use slow, conscious and rational thinking to justify our initial judgments. So just as we can taste quickly if something is sweet, sour or bitter or salty, we can also sense quite quickly if something tastes right or wrong to us in a moral sense. So we can explore a little bit further this analogy of the moral taste buds. We've seen before in this module that we have been using this tool of analogy maps, which allow us to compare different phenomena by common underlying principles or processes or concepts. This also helps us develop a deeper understanding of concepts and um, develops our ability to transfer this understanding to new contexts, to more and more dissimilar contexts. So here we do it. Uh, by comparing our actual taste buds on our tongues, which allow us to taste so, uh, salty, sweet, bitter, and so on, and also our moral taste buds, our ability to sense uh, that something is morally right or wrong. So we have already just talked about that actually this idea of our ability for fast thinking, we can transfer this to how our taste buds work and also how our moral thinking works. And that's also just a quick reminder in regarding our design concept, really teaching for transfer is something that we want to be continuously doing, help students uh, develop this ability for transfer and analogy mapping is such a tool that we can use in the classroom to help students practice this transfer. And so with this activity, we can explore a variety of different principles or concepts and see how they play out in the case of the taste buds and the moral taste buds. Here you can find the full lesson plan also for this activity. And so Jonathan Haidt has been working on his so-called moral foundations theory. So it's the idea that people across different cultures and other backgrounds seem to share a number of moral intuitions, similarly to how we also share, um, humans across cultures do share a number of taste buds. So here are six important moral intuitions of humans that moral psychologists have found. So um, you can also look at this more handout, which also uh, gives a nice overview of these intuitions. So it includes things like uh, care or in the opposite harm. So our sense that we want to protect others 
from harm uh, or violence. It's also associated with feelings of compassion and empathy. Another one is our sense of fairness and we react strongly if we're noticing any cheating going on, for example. Also, we have a strong sense of liberty and we have some aversion then to any kind of oppression or restriction of freedom and so on. Now, the thing is, of course, people are still a little bit... Uh, show some variation to how strongly any of these moral intuitions might be in any one situation. We can also try to make some connections to other themes that we have already explored so far in this module. For example, how might these moral intuitions relate to our ability to cooperate towards sustainability? You can stop the video maybe and try to think of some ideas about how you might answer this question. Here are some possible connections. First of all, we can see how these moral intuitions that we have um, kind of influence the kinds of sustainable development goals that we as humans might be caring about. So for example, our sense of fairness makes us care about things like equality, for example, or our sense of wanting to care for others, wanting to um, not have them exposed to violence or neglect makes us care for having a world without poverty or hunger. And having our a sense of liberty uh, makes us care about having, for example, democracies and strong institutions. So already on a very basic level, these moral intuitions are simply making us humans care about things, about others' well-being, about equality, democracy, human rights and freedom and so on. And even including making us care about the well-being about not just humans, but also other living beings and the planet as a whole. We can also try to relate the moral intuitions to the core design principles for cooperation that we have already um, learned about. So for example, our strong sense of fairness is related to principles like fair distribution of costs and benefits and also that we need to have a fair and inclusive decision making. Or here are actually some possible connections that we can draw. Um, our strong need for liberty and autonomy is related also to some principles such as our need to be involved in decision making and not just being told what to do by others and also our need for to ha that our group as a whole has some autonomy. So again, these moral intuitions, they make us care about these kinds of social conditions that are part of the core design principles and they also make us respond to them in, in certain ways such that really um, sustainable social sustainability is really uh, part, uh, is really about our moral intuitions and how we react to social conditions in more or less helpful ways. Now, Jonathan Haidt has proposed these six moral intuitions, but that doesn't mean that that's now all that there is. For example, other people have also proposed other potential candidates that might, might be in place more or less strongly in certain groups of people, such as truth and honesty or ownership. And the thing is, again, that people um, differ in how strong a moral intuition is in any one situation for them. So, for example, in many places, uh, many groups of people, we see differences between more liberal or politically left-leaning and more conservative or politically right-leaning people. Here is actually re some results of a questionnaire that has been used in moral psychology to measure how uh, how the people respond to certain kinds of yeah with questions, how strongly they feel about, for example, um, yeah, burning a fl your country flag or eating meat or harming a child and so on. And so here are the results of this questionnaire. People found differences between liberals and conservatives. This is from a US population. For example, liberals tended to have a very strong sense of harm and fairness, but less so a sense of lo loyalty, authority, or purity. Versus for conservatives, they tended to have a strong sense across um, 
across all of these different moral intuitions. Here's also an example of a questionnaire that we did a couple of years ago with students in Leipzig, where it's also kind of the pattern is similar to uh, how liberals in the US might respond. But the thing is, of course, that these results are really just an artifact of the kinds of questions you ask people. For example, in this questionnaire, um, people wanted to ask, uh, scientists wanted to ask people to get th to their sense of purity and sacredness. It was really about um, religious questions, que questions around religion. And so conservatives in the US tend to be more religious. And so they respond strongly to anything that has to do with violating religious uh, norms, for example. But if we imagine that we would ask a different question where it's about harming nature or other animals, maybe liberals would be responding much stronger to this. So it's really, one has to be careful about not overinterpreting su such results because they really just, uh, anybody can respond quite differently depending on what the situation is. And so in this way, it is actually more helpful, we think, to think of our moral intuitions kind of like the different filters of a sound equalizer, meaning we tend to amplify and reduce and mix certain intuitions in a particular context or, or moral issue. And so humans will differ in how they mix the moral intuitions uh, when it comes to any particular issue. So in other words, there isn't a person that all has always a strong uh, feeling of care, harm, or, or fairness, no matter what the situation versus others always have less sense of fairness. It really always depends on what the situation is. Now we can also, just as we have done before, explore a little about, bit the causes of our moral intuitions, something that we already touched on with looking at this moral taste buds analogy. And so as a reminder, again, we can use Timberg's questions as this framework to help us look at different kinds of causes. And so um, if we're wanting to ask about what is the evolutionary history of our moral intuitions, why do we have them? We can look at, for example, other animal relatives. Do they also have such moral intuitions? And so did we inherit them from a common ancestor many, many millions of years ago? And we can also ask about the development. Are we, for example, born with these moral intuitions or do they develop over time? And if so, how and why? How do we learn them? We can also, also look at immediate mechanisms. So things like what environmental factors might trigger a particular moral response, a moral intuition. How do they also work in the body and the brain? What emotions and thoughts are associated with them and bodily sensations? And we can also ask about the function of these moral intuitions. So meaning, do they serve important functions? Do they and did they also in the past have a function for our survival in our evolutionary history? And what about today? How do these moral intuitions function today? And again, another question to, to ask ourselves, why, why might it be important for sustainable to explore these causes of our moral taste buds? Why should we care about this? So to kind of get to know a number of, of causes, you can also try this sorting activity or look at the full lesson plan of this, where basically um, you can explore a number of causes of these different taste buds or moral intuitions. This is based on something in Jonathan Haidt's book, also a table that he proposes for how to think about really the various causes of these intuitions, such as their functions and evolutionary origins. So some things to say about these moral intuitions, we can look at our the, the evolutionary history of these intuitions and also a little bit more broadly, even social emotions across species. So for example, we can find the roots of empathy, which are which is associated with this care harm moral foundation um, with the beginning of mammals, where we find that there is an increased uh, sense of caring for offspring and a number of neural 
mechanisms that evolve to make us care for others around us, others in our family. We can find the roots of fairness in social animals, where things like aggression and frustration are there uh, when there is issues of resource distribution and the motivation to share with others also exist in some social primates or in dogs and wolves, for example. So even though these animals might not have a elaborated sense of fairness, but certainly the emotional underpinnings are already can be found in these social animals. We can also find the roots of our sense and, and need for liberty and our aversion to oppression and our also our yeah, moral sense for authority in social animals with a social hierarchy. So um, social hierarchies, there is kind of also these dynamics where we either see that we're following the authority because it's better for us or we might react uh, aggressively to sort of dominant individuals because we don't want to be oppressed. So again, even though these wouldn't be elaborated sen moral senses, but the beginnings of, of these kinds of emotional motivations can already be found in animals with social hierarchies. And then more, more elaborated uh, moral foundations like our sense of loyalty and aversion to betrayal of our group. This would be coming in, uh, in evolutionary history with increased between group competition especially uh, dur during human evolution, whenever then there was this stronger increase of competition between groups, this is where this moral um, intuition played a stronger role to keep us cooperating within our groups and um, competing better with other groups. And finally, our sense of um, disgust or like our moral sense of like um, purity and s sacredness that can also be considered to have very deep evolutionary roots with just general avoidance behavior of animals, such as the need to avoid certain pathogens. Now, what about the role of development? Are we, for example, born with these moral intuitions? If you were listening to the fast and slow thinking uh, presentation, then we you remember that we had this highway analogy, and so we can also think about is basically a moral intuition or some of them are they kind of like already highways like neural connections in our brain that we really get born with. Do we have a sense of right and wrong really early in life or if not how how do they develop? How do we learn it? Here's an example actually of a interesting video which shows how um, yeah, scientists are really looking at three month old, really young babies to see how they are, if they already have this kind of sense uh, of right and wrong. And it tells us something about how scientists really find that actually really young babies already are able to sort of distinguish between good guys and bad guys and they prefer the good guys. And also an interesting thing to do in the classroom to think about how our moral intuitions and our moral tastes develop in our lifetime and also how changeable they are is to explore stories of people who have joined radical movements and then left them. So they tell their stories about how did it come about that they joined a radical movement, what were the circumstances and the motivations and then what led them eventually to leave those movements? What are the things they have learned? And so by exploring these different kinds of stories, we can see a certain uh, factors play a role, such as the human need for belonging, identity and respect, and also different kinds of moral intuitions that uh, motivated people to um, either join this movement and also leave it. But also we see here a role of the human capacities for flexibility, empathy, and learning. And by comparing these different stories, again, students will be able to draw out commonalities. And we can also then try to draw some important conclusions 
uh, and insights regarding maybe how we can ensure that people in our communities don't succumb to radical beliefs or join radical groups and also how should we actually treat people who have radical beliefs or belong to a radical group. Now regarding the idea of moral vocabularies, what does this mean? Well, moral intuitions, they are also associated with certain emotions, as we have seen, and this is often reflected in the choice of words when people express their opinions about moral issues. So that's disgusting, shame on you, axis of evil, that's just unfair, and so on. Those kinds of uh, exclamations are strongly are a sign that people are strongly influenced by their moral intuitions when they speak out on a matter. Now, that alone, that doesn't mean that this is a bad thing. Remember, um, yeah, moral intuitions matter for the things that we care about. And so these emotional responses really matter for our motivations uh, and to work together with others on solving problems in society, such as sustainable development problems and, and other issues that we might care about. So it's not a bad thing that we have these moral intuitions and that they are motivating us. But on the other hand, we have to be a little bit careful because moral language tends to distort facts or simplify complex issues. And people also use moral language, emotional language, to win others for one's movement or to stir certain emotions, such as fear and hatred. And so we have to be a little bit conscious um, of this fact. This, in fact, relates to a question we can ask. Why might it be important for sustainability to notice moral language and its effect on us? And so scientists like Jonathan Haidt and colleagues, they have kind of developed this idea of moral vocabulary. So it's kind of lists of words that we could associate with the uh, existence or presence of any of those moral intuitions. When people talk about something being cruel or talk about wanting to protect uh, suffering animals or other people, then they're really motivated maybe by their moral intuition of care. And, uh, and also when they're talking about things like justice and equal rights uh, and so on, they're motivated by their intuition of fairness. And so you can, we can also yeah, have students practice noticing moral intuitions in different kinds of texts and images. Um, so letting students analyze these texts and images through the lens of the moral intuitions to notice that really these are first of all things that motivate people to, for example, go on the street and, and protest for certain issues. Um, it's kind of that we see often the moral intuitions shine through in the way that people speak about it. For example, also election posters are a great source of moral language. This is here from an election recently in Germany. Now, the thing is also with morality, something that we have to be aware of, the idea that morality binds and blinds. What does this mean? Jonathan Haidt, again from his book, he says, morality binds and blinds. It binds us into ideological teams that fight each other as though the fate of the world depended on our side winning each battle. It blinds us to the fact that each team is composed of good people who have something important to say. Maybe think for a moment what you think about this quote. Do you agree with it? Uh, do you, for example, agree that each team is a composed of good people who have something important to say? And also, how might our answers to this question influence how we react to then people with different opinions? So regarding the idea that morality binds is kind of the the thing that really common purpose and values bind people together. This can also be related again to the core design principles for cooperation. Um, the first design principle, which is about creating a common sense of common identity and common purpose, that's a very strong motivator um, to bind people together. And really being in groups of like-minded people can actually make us feel great, even ecstatic. For example, uh, religious ceremonies or 
being at a concert together with other fans. And even trivial social markers like the color of, of your t-shirt can make us groupish and connect with strangers. This can be a, a good thing. We don't need to know everybody in our group personally, and yet we feel a common identity and a willingness to cooperate with all these other people. But on the other hand, morality at the same time also blinds us. We can at the same time also feel a sense of disconnection or even disgust, sometimes even hatred towards them, towards another group. And so we kind of can be more sort of in a moral matrix or bubble where we think um, everybody in our group is right and morally on the right side and the other guys are, are wrong and uh, evil even. And so uh, just as much even trivial social markers like color of t-shirt can make us feel positive towards us and negative towards them. So again, even though we don't know any of the people personally, we feel a sense of uh, negativity towards them, even though we've never really met them, just because of a symbol that they might be wearing on their shirt. So this pr presents certainly a challenge for cooperation even today in the big societies that we live in. Here's, for example, from American politics, um, a view on how increasing how polar polarization between Democrats and Republicans has increased in the last uh, about 30 years. And this is really presenting a problem to democracies in not just the US, but also other countries. And we find also this strong sense uh, role of language and our ability for symbolic thinking that uh, symbols bind people together into moral communities. Even if we don't know most people in this community, we feel a sense of common identity and are willing to contribute to the group. And at the same time, that then can also make us feel a sense of disconnect or disgust towards others who are about a different symbol. All this is related to this concept of ethnocentrism, which is the tendency to prefer one's own group and regard it as more normal or right or superior and others as unnormal or strange or even wrong and inferior. And again, these kind of develop these experiments with, with babies also show that from an early age, such as nine months old, we humans already start to prefer those who resemble us in their preferences, language and appearance. So there's already also a early origin of this kind of um, ethnocentrism that we need to think about how to overcome this in our societies today. As a lesson idea, students could, for example, search in the media or in historic sources for texts or pictures um, in which the author aims to exploit this human tendency for ethnocentric thinking by stirring up fear or aggression towards a certain group which words or phrases or pictures are used and what effects are produced in the listeners or, or in the audience. There's also, we have been um, looking at computer simulations as also another teaching tool um, to explore social ecological systems and the evolution of behaviors. And there's also a, a model the that shows the evolution of ethnocentrism that indeed it can why did ethnocentric tendencies evolve in our species? Well, it is because ethnocentrists actually, it's kind of the adaptive uh, strategy up to a certain point. And this can be shown in models like this. And so interestingly, if we think about it, our differences of opinion are less, emo less emotional when it comes to non-ethical issues. Maybe you remember this kind of phenomenon uh, about people discussing on social media whether this image shows a blue dress or a white dress. And um, even though there were big debates and people saw it really differently, but could we really say that we despised or hated the people who didn't see it like we did? And why might this be? Why might this not have stirred up so much hatred uh, compared to other issues that we disagree uh, on? We could use our understanding of different kinds of optical illusions to increase maybe perspective taking around moral issues. 
For example, some illusions are such that we can switch perspective. For example, with this cube, we can see it as if we're looking at it from the top, like this is the top square. But if we train a little bit, if we pay attention and focus, we can also see it like we're looking at it from the bottom, like we see this uh, from the bottom. So we can actually switch around and s switch our perspective if we want to. With other illusions, it's not so easy. Sometimes we really can't see it differently, even if we know it. Um, for example, it's very hard for us to not see those blue lines getting longer and shorter, even though they're actually not changing in size. And it's very difficult to not see that. So how could we actually, when we're looking at uh, moral issues and we have to find common ground with others that we might disagree with, how could we more train us to see it more from both sides or from several sides. Music